I guess we'll start. Hello, welcome back from lunch. Ladies and gentlemen, and the millions of viewers and the screens around the world. My name is uh, Clemens Fastos. I am the lead architect for the Azure IoT services. Um, what that means is that when I say something in the team, then sometimes they listen to me. Um, and I'll talk about Azure IoT security. And uh, to start with, let me tell you what book I currently read. I read a book that uh, was authored in 1984 and uh, that uh, has been reissued in 1999 called Normal Accidents. And it's really about the sociology of uh, accidents that happen in complex systems, which is really interesting. And it has to do with IoT because what we're doing here is we're building we're starting to build very complex systems that are interacting with each other and where security takes up new shapes and shapes that we're not so familiar with as an industry, especially when I talk about the IT industry. Um, you should uh, score the session afterwards. You're going to see the, the barcode again to be entered into the daily prize drawing of something that's sh surely fabulous. I have no idea what it is, though. All right, so I'm going to talk about the connected things in the IoT. Um, I'll uh, give you a bit of an um, inventory of what we already know, practices that we already um, know how to do. Um, and then also, and this is why this talk is not only for you in the room um, who um, have made the time to come to build and to think that investing time in coming to a Microsoft conference is a good idea. But seriously, the folks who are going to wa watch this later, um, who probably don't even know yet that there are an audience, also for them, it is very interesting, and you'll know why. Um, I'll talk about some security and privacy principles um, that we're following and that we're giving out as guidance as it relates to the IoT. And I'll talk about the Azure IoT services and how they go and implement them. And I'm also going to give you some outlook and roadmap, because we're really only at the beginning of a journey here. Um, at, as an industry, because the IoT is currently at the top of the high si hype cycle, and right now, most is written not in code, but in magazines and in marketing brochures. And we're going to get to the point where most is going to be written in code, and then we're going to go and go down into that, oh my god, this is really difficult phase, until we actually land on a um, plateau of uh, productivity. When I talk about connected things or the IoT, this is a picture that kind of covers what I mean and trying to be comprehensive. Um, so we have um, in personal environments and networks, we have watches, glasses, work tools, hearing aids, robotic assistants, bionic systems. Um, they're really around people or in very small environments, stuff that gets wired together. Then we have those things kind of wired up to bigger systems. Uh, and, and also, I shouldn't forget, in personal environments and local environments in these networks, what you can also count towards that is local bus systems that are industrial automation systems, right? Stuff that gets plugged together, a CAN bus. Then you have larger systems, which are put together from multiple devices, homes, vehicles, seagoing vessels, factories, farms, oil platforms, which have a, a local network. A vehicle today, like the typical upper class luxury vehicle you can buy has 40 microprocessors in it, microcontrollers in it. Your key fob has a microcontroller in it. It talks via radio with your car. That's already a fairly complex system all put together on a CAN bus. Those, those devices will speak to external, increasingly speak to external systems. This is, these local systems exist and they have been evolving for many years as closed systems. Arguably, some of the first IoT applications were built in, at least on what we know from the history record, on, um, on this side of the Iron Curtain, um, by uh, the Department of Defense for the purpose of detecting Russian bombers within very, very short time, which were very large computing systems um, that were plugged together and they were effectively taking sensor data in, 
right, radar data in, and we're correlating that, that data to detect within very short time whether there would be an attack that's arguably the first IoT system that was ever built. And that already had a notion of integrating data from different sites into one common information base, and that's something that was built in the early 60s. So when I say cloud here, I don't necessarily mean our cloud, uh, our public cloud, but I also mean cloud systems in general. Um, I mean data center systems. You have local environments that communicate out to, with centralized data collection, data analysis, and control systems, either directly through an ISP system or through an MNO, mobile network operator, gateway system. So that's when I, when I say connected things, I mean those systems. And now the question is, how do we go and secure, how we go, go about securing all those things? Now, let's think about how important the security is in here. This is about IoT-enabled infrastructure, right? Well, the picture I showed you previously is industrial automation. You can go and easily fit into that picture, and I'm going to get back to that and how you can go and fit that into the picture. But here you have enabled infrastructure, cities, buildings, energy, health, mobility, traffic flow. You have health systems, lab equipment, energy, nuclear waste management, coal mining, buildings, signage, medical emergency systems. All of those systems which are vital to our communities and which are run somehow today, and they work. And what we want to do is we want to use digital technology to make it ever more efficient. But that means that we're now creating more integration, more communication paths, potentially more attack surface, obviously. Which leads to one very important point. Safety matters. Security is a function of the overall safety strategy for systems. In IT, security kind of is more or less a self-contained thing. With the Internet of Things, it becomes up-leveled. The, the whole story becomes up-leveled. The, uh, the, the highest priority thing is really safety in many environments. So for a few sentences here. Many IoT solutions control critical operations at the core of industrial and civil infrastructure. So digital security will be increasingly interwoven with physical safety of life and equipment. That's something that's, dr that's driving me. My boss has told me, hey, since you're the architect for those services, the one thing I want to take care of is I want our security story to be right. And that's something that I have a lot of respect for because of this. Because really, it's not only a security story. It's not an infosec story. It's a safety story. Click here. Also, many IoT solutions will provide very deep and near real-time ins insight into industrial and business processes, as well as into homes and the immediate personal environment. Privacy matters. And one thing we're very clear about in, across the entire platform, specifically in Azure, is that your data is your data. And that if you store your application data in our platform, it is your data. And we're going to help you protect it. What you'll also find us do is to write up the guidance and the principles that we follow for our own services. For instance, how do we protect the data that is in, let's say, Outlook.com. We have very strong principles around how we think about privacy for services that we build for customers. That we go and write those down and help people, help, help developers who are building IoT apps on top of our platform follow those principles if they want to. But the foundational principle that we have around privacy is your data is your data. We're not going to go and offer you a service and then do analytics and you know, create value of that data um, like others might want to do. So what do we already know? We know a lot of things. And now I want to go and introduce a, a, a type of person that we are now starting to interact with, which is a type of person who's kind of been on the other side of the fence and who are now getting to know as IT people. 
It's the software people who are on the operational side. Hardware, who have so far been kind of mostly hardware designers, machine designers, machine builders, who've been seeing kind of software as a, a little bit of additional goop that needs to be done, but who become increasingly more software developers and now go on and plug in those things together. So those people I call operation, operational technology engineers. These are the real engineers, if you will. Uh, the people who don't build software. We call ourselves engineers, but the people who have called themselves engineers before we started to do that, um, that's the people who I mean. Who have very rigid procedures around a lot of stuff already, around safety. And there's rules and there's international standards. There's a lot of stuff that's happening on the safety side that we can take a look at. And, that's, and the reason why I read the book, and why I read not only that book, but a ton of books is, we can learn a lot from literally decades of information, decades of experience around safety, because we're now part of a context that is very often safety driven with IoT solutions. So as IT engineers, we know how to make a lot of digital things secure, which I'm going to go in and go through a little bit more in detail. Secure development life cycles, secure network technologies, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to go get to those. OT engineers know have standards, procedures, training, continuous improvement. Some people will say, oh my god, that's waterfall. Yes, some of those things are waterfall. Safety management and security management is a very rigid thing for a reason, because you don't want to kill people. So there's going to be a culture clash between those two worlds of the software side, where we want to do agile and very quick and everything, and on the operational side. And we see those culture clashes in all of the engagements that we're in, like, I'm not going to update my software on the device. And in fact, Windows XP, one of the reasons why Windows is, is so, still so popular in the industrial automation space is because it's still supported. The embedded version is still supported. It's an operating system that was published, what, 13, 14 years ago now. It's still in support. I don't want to update my system. That's a that's never change a running system. That's something that's ingrained in the in the culture of operational operational technology. And of course, they have a notion of risk and hazard and, uh, and hazards that we really don't have any experience with as IT people. We don't kill stuff. We don't kill people with our stuff usually. So. Microsoft has a, has a number of cloud security principles. I took this from a talk that um, um, Mark Rusinovich did at the RSA conference. So we, first, we protect. So these are capabilities that we built into the platform and that we help you with. Security develop, secure development si life cycle, um, network and identity isolation, that's stuff that we do at the network, at the network level, least privilege, just-in-time access. That's something how we do security containers, vulnerabilities, and update management. That's what we help with with the platform. And then we're actually doing a ton of work for you. And that's um, something for another talk that's specifically about Azure security all up. Um, in terms of auditing certification, I'm going to name a few standards at, at the end of the talk. Lifesight penetration testing, where we're actually having our platform attacked at all times. Uh, and we have bug bounties out. Um, it's actually a handsome money that you can earn by uh, just hacking our platform in live production. Um, and we have instituted fraud and abuse uh, detection. We have a digital crimes unit that's, uh, that's helping with digital crimes, helping things, tracking things down, tracking botnets down. Um, we're having pretty sophisticated di dist uh, distributed denial of service defenses. So we're having a lot of stuff that we're already doing kind of just at the, at the data center level where we're securing the platform as an infrastructure. For applications, for solutions, but also for products, one thing we have is the secure development lifecycle. And the secure development lifecycle is something that has emerged out of Microsoft's um, bad days. If you remember Windows XP before uh, Windows XP SP2, um, those were not very happy times because uh, security was there. Security was arguably in NT from the very beginning, but it was not consistent. There was not a consistent process for how to apply security principles. 
So this, the, the platform, the core was OK. The shell didn't care much or not as, as much as they should. And it was pretty uneven across teams. Every team could kind of do its own, apply its own principles. That stopped with the security reset that was effectively started with Windows XP SP2. The software, de secure, the secure development lifecycle was um, effectively born completely out of this, which says, first of all, there's a training requirement that everybody who participates in the process needs to have a minimal education around security. And that's something that we live. Like, uh, there's required security training for every engineer that, who touches code um, at Microsoft, so we have, all have to go in through this every year to retrain. Then on the requirements phase, for any product or any software that you write, you establish what the security requirements are. What's your baseline? What is acceptable? What is not acceptable? Based on, once, once you've done that, then you establish uh, what the um, design requirements are. And then you have a rough sketch of what your architecture is going to be, and then you do threat modeling, which means you try to figure out what are the attack surfaces that you have in your application. Right? And then you make a call. Once, you've, once you know what the potential threads are, right, what your attack vectors are, it could be, then you make a decision of which you want to mitigate and how they want, you want to mitigate them. And sometimes you will choose not to mitigate some. But if you choose not to mitigate them, some, that is a documented act, and you're explicit about it. And that's something that matters. If this looks like waterfall for it to you, yeah, that's waterfall. But that's OK. Because with the next iteration, you can come back to this. So we're, we're practicing this even in the agile projects. We're doing that all the time. And that's something, and then you go into you know, implementation, use only approved tools, only approved algorithms. There is. For instance, MD5 is uh, one of those uh, uh, hash, hash algorithms that's still very popular. And here is um, a new standard. And there's a new standard that's still using MD5. In Microsoft, we can't use MD5, period, for no purpose. If we just need to have a hash, just a hash function to go and identify something, just a hash function to go and create a hash table, we can't use SHA-2. Because it's unclear whether we would use it for security reasons. And so we, we have to use other hashes if we only need to have them for non-secure purposes. We're very strict about those things, about those procedures. So all of those things, I'm not going to give you a whole talk about the SDL. You can get all that material from SDL. There's actually qualified partners who can help you establish in the SDL. The SDL is something that is very useful to build secure software, and we believe also secure products. What we're currently doing is we're looking through the SDL and see how much we can go and extend that to makers and also to, indust to industrial product folks. What changes we need to make, what augmentations we need to make, and we're also very happy to get feedback on this. What's also important, and uh, Kevin has, uh, in the previous talk, talked about this, is defense in depth. And defense in depth is something that we take very seriously at all layers and also out um, in, all, um, in all these different zones. So there's the cloud zone, what we want to do, what we go and do defense in depth on the data center side. That starts with the physical layer, obviously getting into a data center, getting to a computer in one of our data centers is going to be not a very happy experience um, if you are not authorized to do that. Um, I'm sure someone will be in the way at some point. Then, but even then, one of the things we do kind of at the host and physical layer is we have strict separation between the site and the software that runs in it. So I would not be able to tell which of the machines run my runs my workload. That's something that we strictly separate out. So there's defense in depth that we do on the cloud side. There's defense in depth that we also help with in on the device side. So with Windows 10. Also with Windows 8, with the current operating system, um, and with the phone operating system, we have a defense and death model that really starts down at the hardware level and allows you to have, with a TPM chip, um, keys that are in the hardware, that are locked in the hardware, and that then you have a trusted model where you can have a secure bootloader that's keyed by that TPM that will then go and load the operating system, that will then go and load only trusted components. So you can create this sandbox. You can create these super secure systems. 
that's the foundation. Having the secure, having secure uh, or uh, defense in depth, basically taking measures at all levels of the system is the foundation for all the things that we do and all the things that we believe need to be done in IoT. But that's not all because there's, the reality kind of gets in the way um, sometimes. The first thing is not all devices are devices that are um, at the range where you can go and run um, a s full operating system with all the security features. We have $10,000 servers on the one side, which are super easy to defend, and we have $1 sensors on the other side that are basically just a little microcontroller. If you just take a look at, at the maker platforms, because they're actually a good point of reference, the Raspberry Pi is a full computer and has ample capacity. If you're playing with, with one of the lower, lowest end Arduinos, that's, that's about the capacity that my Sinclair ZX81 had. It's just much faster. But it's a huge range. So you have these super, super cheap sensors. And the only way we're going to get to however a trillion devices it's going to be, um, read the next analyst thing uh, next week, and it's going to be some quadrillion. Um, the only way how that's going to happen is that stuff is going to be fairly cheap. And um, so it's going to be $1 devices, $2 devices. And really, when you think about, and this is what I say with that, with the second bullet, how much can you add to a toaster? So you make a toaster, and you make a connected toaster instead of just making a plain toaster. And you sell that toaster usually for $39.95. How much, how much more expensive can the connected toaster be? 10 bucks. Maybe, yeah. So if you make it 10 bucks, then that is five, $5 for the retailer, right? And then that's um, $2 for all the other people who want to go and, and make money on this. So it's three. And then um, the actual bomb that you get allocated is probably $1.50. And that's what you got to live with for the logic and the, and the connect connectivity logic and all those things. So that makes it kind of hard. So that constraints the computational capabilities, which means that also constraints how much crypto you can do. Um, memory storage capa capacity um, that also says how much logging, for instance, you can do, how much can you can keep track of things. Energy consumption. It's a denial of service attack if you can if you can make a device who runs on that runs on battery just burn its burn its battery on on senseless compute work. And then the component quality is also a big factor. A sensor that costs a dollar with connectivity logic costs just a dollar. There are sensors you can buy that cost five and 10, and 50, and 500, and 5,000, depending on the quality. The lowest quality sensor will potentially break earlier. The interesting thing is a hacked sensor and a broken sensor are kind of hard to distinguish. So it also becomes a data quality issue all of a sudden. So data quality kind of also gets looped into with the security and the safety thing. So capability constraint devices is something that is a, that's, a, that's a big concern. Also, not everything that we see is greenfield, right? Factories, other industrial utility environments are all brownfield. Production lines are getting upgraded. They get retooled, but you don't go and build a whole new building except for it, when you set up a new site, then you do. But otherwise, you are using, reusing equipment. And there's many environments which have been upgraded for you know, 40, 50 years and which keep get, getting upgraded. My favorite example, because I'm a big geek, um, airplane geek, is the Boeing B-52, which um, ha has now been flying for uh, 60 years and uh, will continue to fly until 2040 when the oldest airplanes are going to be 80 years old. And they just keep getting, getting upgraded one by one by one by one, and many factory environments are just like that. So you don't get to do a greenfield brand new install in many environments, especially not when it comes to infrastructure. 
Buildings and homes are like that too. If you think about how you are introducing, just in your house, introducing new technology, you don't go to Best Buy and say, I would like to buy the, whole, the half of the store. No. You go and buy a thing, and then three months later, you go to buy another thing, and then three months later, you go with your wife, and she says, no. <laughs> and so you wait another three months. Um, so it's a, it's a process that goes one by one by one, and that also creates a lot of diversity in your systems, but it's also not a, it's not a consistent one, one story around security, obviously, that comes out of this. What we found very surprising is the legacy network design attitude in specifically in industrial environments, in industrial automation environments. Um, that's something that came as, shouldn't have come as a surprise to us when we were starting to look at this from a, um, a team perspective two and a half years ago. But it kind of was because as IT people, you're now kind of expecting that you have some, lev some application level security capabilities, right? An endpoint here, an endpoint there, and they have a notion of you know, identifying each other towards each other. And we found in very many environments, none of that. In very many environments that we find, and that's in industrial automation as well as in, in manufacturing and as well as in very many other environments, um, is that because the IT folks the cutting edge IT folks have long been so self-absorbed with building all these wonderful social experiences. They haven't been really paying attention much to what has been happening in those industrial environments. And as a consequence, they've been just using best practices off the, off the shelf effectively to go and build those networks, which you can't blame them for. And what's, what has happened is that they've built secure networks that mimic the exact uh, scenarios of how they secure the perimeter. So they built walls, and then in those walls you can go and move freely, and then you build doors into those systems, gates, that you can come through. So you have a secured network, um, and you can't get into that network, the network is isolated. Once you're in the network, it's actually fairly easy to communicate with other parties, and if you want to get in, then you have a designed door. That designed door looks often like this, you can buy security in the industrial automation space in the form of two black boxes um, from a number of vendors. There's dozens and dozens of vendors who sell, who sell these, these boxes, which are effectively little VPN bridges, which have sometimes advertised hardware certificates, which make them super, super secure. And the argument there is, you, so you take an X509 certificate, you put it into the hardware, and therefore the hardware is now certified to be secure. That's nonsense, but that's actually in the marketing material. So now you're doing this. Now you're actually setting up your network, and this is, exi this is existing practice. You have this, this lo the local area production network. You have a, a, a remote service technician who wants to go and get, get at this with his workstation in, in some other place. So they go and build this bridge. What are the threats that are being mitigated or that exist in this, right? You have um, that this is the th threat modeling model. So you have spoofing, temporary repudiation, um, information disclosure, denial of service, elevation of privilege. And I've done a, a little modeling of this model um, where um, the communication path is subject to tampering and information disclosure and denial of service. The machine control logic is actually um, threatened by all those things. The path to the configuration of the device is uh, also a TID. The configuration itself is, uh, sub is potentially subject to repudiation. The operator um, is also subject to spoofing and repudiation, so we've got to go and uh, um, authenticate, uh, authenticate him uh, or her. So this, this is kind of the threat model for that particular communication link. So those security devices, what do they help with? Well. Not a whole lot. What they help with is basically just tampering and information disclosure, making the network secure. But they're now doing something that's actually very dangerous. They're fusing the networks. Because one network becomes part of the other network because there is no S in VPN. VPN is a network integration bridging technology. There is no S in VPN. This S is only about 
having a secure network cable that you plug into that one thing, into the another thing in that virtual network cable, that the network cable is virtual. It runs over the internet. But there's otherwise, it's not a security technology. It actually is worse because it enables that if you own the service desk, you can own the machine. Because with the attitude of not having endpoint level security, that's a huge problem. And that's something that we find in a lot of environments, in a lot of legacy environments. And that is also the way how the Stuxnet worm, that you may have heard of, worked. That didn't even need to have a VPN uh, access. That was, it was enough to go infect a USB stick that was put into one of those service desks that then got owned inside of the factory, which then staged a pretty elaborate attack against um, those systems which were pretty wide open to access. What was, um, this was one of the moments where I had to close my eyes and basically just leave the room. Um, we've also seen this in vehicle telematics. So there are, in vehicle telematics, in, in, this is in, in a commercial environment, that exact same model. So you have trucks that dial in, that have a, have a network connection over 3G, um, that effectively dial up into a VPN, into v VPN gateway in two, one of two ways, either through a private APN that the mobile network operator creates, which is advertised as peer-to-peer -peer capable. So through that private APN, you're, you're dialing into a, VPN, into a VPN, which is peer-to-peer -peer capable, which means that the devices can talk to each other. Um, and, but we also have seen other variations of this where they go and uh, dial into a, VPN, into a VPN that's on site. So one of the two. So either they come through a public APN or they go through a private APN. And then once you own one of those vehicles, I mean, you own them in security sense, right? You hack them. You get pretty direct access to all the rest that's in the network. And that's pretty scary. There's other issues with this. So this is a, obviously, security, obviously a security risk. There's more issues. For instance, so when you do this, when you use this lower level, effectively layer two network integration te technique to go and, in and integrate a truck with a cloud system and try to send data to the truck, you have to stick with that networking technology, right? So you have to go and do the DNS thing, and you need to do the DHCP thing if you don't have static IP addresses. Let's say you don't have to do that. Well, then you still have to, so you need to go and find, you need to register the device. Um, and then you also need to, you know, if you want to send a message to a truck and, that's, and that truck is currently not online because it's driving through a tunnel or it's currently on a ferry or whatever, then you have to wait until that truck shows up again. So there's temporal coupling that you're creating by having everything being a network server. But it is really dangerous because now you're tr effectively putting, you're putting devices that are owned and operated by different people and that are exposed to the environment into a single VPN. Again, there's no S in VPN. So let's go back to those sensors because let's go more on the on the, what was that, the left side um, of um, the, the continuum when it comes to prices. Let's think about all the little gadgets and gizmos you can buy for the home. Let's think about $5, $10 weather sensors, sensor equipment that you put on the side of buildings to know what the noise level, what the pollution level, what the, the um, uh, environmental conditions are throughout a city. Let's make those 20 bucks or 50 bucks. But those devices all need to be, need to be relatively cheap. They'll be equipped with, with, small, um, with small and low capability circuitry. They will, if you, act, if you actually operate them as servers, they will have to go and triage the traffic that comes in them, they have to make a decision of whether they want to, go, want to go and let someone in or not. If someone comes and attacks them, 
they'll have to keep a log because if you put a device or a server out there and you don't look into the log of whether someone attacks it, well then eventually they're gonna come, they're gonna get in. You have to look for this. So how does a device which is sitting somewhere in, you know, pinned against the wall keep a log and who's looking at that log? So will you go and defend a million tiny underpowered public, public network servers? Or do you think they could help, need some help with that? And we think they could need some help with that. So we have a principle that is nothing that we invented, but we gave it a name. It's called service-assisted communication. It's effectively a model where all devices that are in an IoT scenario, which are the small, um, these small devices that you find around the house, the ones that are um, you know, just adding a dollar or three or five to the bill of materials, how we can go and even reason about security in that world, which means we need to have a service. And that service can either live on a field gateway, that's a device that you have around the house or in the facility which can go and help out, or it's a cloud service. So you have this, you have an isolated network here. An isolated network can be anything. It's effectively the, the PAN that you had in the initial slide or the local network that I had on the initial slide, um, it can be um, an, anything from a mobile operator network cell to, a, um, to you know, the, your local home network. And there's going to be a router at the edge. Let's establish first one thing. It has been said, and it's, there's plenty of articles you can read, there's more, being more written in, word, in prose than there's written in code. There's plenty of articles that you can read that say, we must have IPv6 because we're going to have 10 billion devices, and every one of those devices needs to have a public IP address. That, ladies and gentlemen, is complete nonsense. And it is complete nonsense because count all the devices that you have in your own homes, and you're geeks, which means you're going to have plenty of those, which have a public routable IP address. How many? One. One, two. Adventurous. Here, you have five. Well, you're a professor. Um, that's not a lot. It's, it's your gateway. <laughs> it's your router. And NAT is not a bad idea at all. It's actually a good idea because it keeps the networks, it keeps those networks separate. Your devices that you have, and the extra, even if you bring an extra new device in your home, or even if you bring an extra new device in the, in the, to that, into that production environment, the presence of that device doesn't change the, the foundational design of your network, which isn't expecting that anybody shows up to visit um, uh, over you know, the lower network layers. So having that network address translation, having the, the, the separation between those networks is a healthy thing to have, and I think that's also something that's worth preserving. Who needs IPv6 are the people who are building these mobile um, base stations, because that's going to explode. And mobile base stations, not only as traditional mobile network operators, but also things like Sigfox, um, which is a French company who is building a ISM, ba ISM band-based networks, where you can buy, buy a data plan that gives you 50 messages uh, per, or 128 messages um, per, per day, which each have like 16 bytes. But that's enough. If you want to build a connected cow, no kidding, no kidding. You can laugh for a second. Serious business. Connected cow, if you want to know when that cow, when that cow is ready to have babies, that's an art to figure out. Also, you just gener generally, if you have a very, very large farm, you want to know whether your cows are li still living or whether they're somewhere out dead. And that's something you can do with a service like this very nicely. So all of those things are connected to these routers. So the way how this works is, is very simple. Any device goes and connects out through a gateway to a service gateway. That service gateway has a bucket that's assigned to that device. The device is peered with that service gateway, which means it contains, it has one credential and it knows one peer that it will communicate with, ever. 
it doesn't need to have a local, a local authentication database. It doesn't need to have any of those things. It only needs to know that one key that it, of the party that it trusts, and it needs to have a key to identify itself and a second key to roll. Then it will go and create a stable connection out to that service gateway whenever it sees the network. To send messages to the device, you go, and go from the client, you send data to the service gateway, to a name and not to an address which very nicely solves the problem of a car driving, a, a, driving along a road fast. I'm thinking Germany um, on the Autobahn, where we don't have these crazy restrictions that you people have here. Um, so so if, when I go with normal cruising speed at home, like 100 miles an hour, um, I switch cell towers about every minute or so, every one and a half minutes. I hop between cell towers, specifically on the higher band, on the higher throughput bands, which means I also get a new address at each of those, which means I'm inconvenient to, uh, to reach, you know, to get the timing right, because I'll be switching networks. Um, and also, I'll be difficult to address if I get a local address there. This here, this model is solving that very nicely by having a stable name. And whenever I, I reconnect effectively, I just go and pull uh, messages for me from that service gateway. And then sending in, I'm sending through that gateway. That gateway, again, might be local. So it might be a local gateway device that you have in the house. Or it might be uh, a cloud gateway of the sort that we're building. The device does not listen for unsolicited traffic. All the connections are device initiated and outbound. Port mapping is automatic and outbound. And no inbound ports open. The attack surface is minimized. Your house is safe. That's the other crazy thing, right? If you have UPnP support on your uh, wireless LAN router and you have that turned on, you're crazy. So the scenario we see people asking for all the time is, I want to control my insert device here, washer, dryer, car, with my cell phone, with my iPhone, or my Galaxy, or my Lumia. So how do you realize that? Well, you go through the same model. You don't need to have local peering, but you go through a service gateway, or you will go, and that's even more likely, through a mobile backend. You connect the device up to that service gateway. That's where it gets nailed up, right? And then you come from the mobile device, go through the mobile app, or go straight th uh, to the service gateway if you have the necessary rights, and send the message that way. So let's say you want to go and build a, a solution for car sharing. And for car sharing where um, you can go and uh, say, hey, I need to have a car that I want to go and drive, and I want to uh, get, it, I wanna get the, clo the closest car. Seconds later, the app says, hey, yeah, I have a car for you. The car is over there, over there, over there, and then uh, it's the white one, um, and uh, just walk up to it. So I walk up to it, and on the app, I can go and push a button, car unlocks. Magic. Well, the authorization for that act of unlocking the car is something that will have to be brokered by the system. Either it tells my phone some information to have a local um, connectivity, but that's something that would depend on certain radio capabilities in my phone, or it does the remote unlock directly when I push that button, and that would then come through that path where the mobile backend is effectively implementing the authorization logic. But it's a very elegant solution to, to avoid all of the local networking setup stuff because everybody can rendezvous in a single place. And it is secure because both parties have a peered connection with a trusted system. And you get to portal the coupling out of it. A further thing that's also part of this services system communication model is trust brokerage for nomadic devices. The, the, current, the current models for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle and vehicle-to-infrastructure um, uh, standards, they're ISO standards now, 
uh, call effective for, the, for creating the largest PKI system in the world, where effectively every car gets um, a certificate, and those certificates are managed at massive scale, and uh, we're going to be ending up with a system that will go and distribute and roll and replace certificates at the scale of several billion vehicles, eventually. And also, we'll go and distribute the, ne the necessary certificate of revocation lists, which are going to be funny because you know stuff gets stolen, stuff get stuff breaks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're also going to have certificate of revocation, revocation lists of kind of the same dimensions. That is not going to work. We have mechanisms to deal with that, and mechanisms like having a device, a device identity system, and a token, a token system that allows to do this. Right. So I trust as a device, that registry. The other device also trusts that registry, and which means now a device can ask for a token that it under, and then another uh, device can actually um, see as being trustworthy. And that token can be varied in lifetime. And that's something that's a very useful model for enabling peer-to-peer -peer communication, which will be es essential. Because if you're driving along a street, and you need to have information from the infrastructure, what your, what your traffic lights are doing, or what your, your street sensors are doing. You can't rely on cloud connectivity, which means local radio is something that's important. But what we can't do is we can't have this huge PKIA infrastructure with trying to roll certs, et cetera. We need to have something that's lighter weight. And having that um, a, a cloud brokered trust model where you have tokens with a limited lifetime, which you can go and reacquire is something that's actually more feasible. So all that translated into vehicle telematics from the previous picture is this is something that we do today with, I'll give you a name, Scania. They're a commercial truck company. And they have an AMQP bridge in their telematics box. And that telematics box is talking through to Azure using the AMQP link. That is not the only solution that does that. We have another solution that's, that's from Delphi. It's a little fob that you can go and plug into your car. That's also using the same principle. And we have a number of other solutions that do that. In vehicle telematics, another set of manufacturers that I can't name. You have an AMQP 1.0 link. It's bi-directional. It's secure by default, reliable transfer, application level and no exposure to the tiers. They're all not sitting on the same network. Right? There's no integration at the lowest level. It's effectively just all application level integration. In industrial automation, we're working very closely. I'm actually sitting, I'm, um, sitting on the OPC Foundation's uh, Technical Advisory Council. And I'm also a member of the OPC UA Working Group, which is um, a uh, consortium, 460 companies, mostly all from the operational technology side in industrial automation, who are creating standards um, for industrial automation integration. And OPC UA is something that has been built kind of for making creating compatibility, creating integration on the factory floor. Realizing that security is important, OPC UA already implements point to point security. But that doesn't change the fact that the factory floor, per se, is not necessarily secure. So the model we're putting into OPC UA for, at the working group level is a model where you have the notion of an OPC UA gateway. And then later, we're also putting this into the OPC servers so that the cloud link is, ha is done through exactly the same principle, all outbound, sta stable connection, and that's how the routing happens. So OPC UA or DDS, or any other protocol that's being used inside, and then having effectively a gateway that facilitates the communication. We've demonstrated this at Hanover Messe uh, with a number of, uh, of uh, companies. Um, uh, the, the flagship device, so to, so to speak, was from C-Labs. That's a company in Seattle uh, that's uh, building uh, industrial automation solutions. And they have built a bridge um, between OPC and the cloud that you can actually buy as a device. Um, or the software from C Labs to go and make that integration happen. What we're doing in the working group now is kind of formalizing that link <coughs> for that sort of integration so that we can go from an environment which has not been designed for being exposed to the cloud and can go and very securely link this with environments that are 
um, in the cloud, and that also um, you know, brings all the reliability capabilities with it because an OPC UA uh, environment might quite well be sitting on a truck and moving or sitting on a ship and moving. Scale is another um, massive, massive issue. If we think about these vehicle solutions, we're talking about devices, we're talking about management of devices at the scale of millions. If we're building this into a, into a standard, as a standard capability into vehicles, you're quickly at a million, two million, three million vehicles output out of a single brand per year. That's a lot. If you think about how, the biggest, how big the biggest Active Directory deployment is that you know, that's magnitudes away from that. So you have to have infrastructure that actually goes and deals with that identity. And it also can do software update management, which is important at that scale. And just to illustrate, right, a million is a lot. Right? So what we have as makers and prototypes and at hackathons is like hundreds of devices. Enterprise scale, what we're all proud of, is 10,000s of devices. Consumer products is millions of devices. So that's something that calls for additional infrastructure to, to deal with the security. So the thing we're building is, as part of the Azure IoT suite, a piece that sits in the Azure IoT suite, which is a dedicated component specifically aiming to solve the scale issues and specifically the security issues. So IoT Hub, as part of the IoT suite, provides effectively a model for creating millions of devices, up to 10 million devices per device for, per um, IoT Hub is currently the goal that we have with explicit support for field gateways, explicit support for additional protocols as a service solution that, you can, that you'll be able to build, to effectively go to the Azure portal and create an IoT hub and you're gonna get this bi-directional capability. That bi-directional capability will give you a way to go and talk directly with that IOP, IoT uh, hub using HTTPS one, point one or two, um, or with AMQP S, and I'm explicit about the S here. And it will also give you a way, and this is something we're gonna provide as a self-hostable capability to talk MQTT S as a capability. And that gateway will also be the foundation that you can go and build on if you want to support further protocols. And we're gonna go and extend to further protocols as well. The way you can th think of IoT Hub is that it is a super, charged bi-directional version of Event Hub with further capabilities. So it's building on the foundational scale of Event Hub, which can today already do um, a million sources and over one gigabyte per second throughput. We're currently doing on Event Hub over 15 billion messages per day. And so on that capability, we're building up the IoT Hub on that, on, that, on that scale foundation, and we're actually extending that even. For service-assisted connectivity, you're gonna have these per-device command queues. So let me go through this quickly. So hyperscale identity, there's a re identity registry in there, so that you can have millions of these devices in the IoT Hub registered. So we're gonna allow you to go and register them, and we'll, it will also be able to federate identity with Active Directory. We're gonna be secure by principle. At the main gateway of the IoT hub, you will not be able to use protocols that are not secure. We will not allow plain HTTP traffic. If you wanna do H plain HTTP traffic, you can do that, but you have to go and make it self-hosted gateway. We will support initially TLS uh, with uh, certs. We will then also extend this to also support TLS PSK, which shaves off the certificate exchange and allows you to operate with shared keys on both sides of the connection, which makes the exchange much, much quicker 
and much, much lighter weight and specifically designed for that purpose. We're also looking into using TLS RPK, which is a raw public key, which does the same thing with asymmetric cryptography. And that is specifically interesting for super bandwidth constraint links. So if you're paying your M2M connection by the kilobyte, then you know, always sending five kilobyte certs um, across the wire is not a good idea if it's always the same thing. Um, and uh, typically, because the peering is strong, because you have a gateway and a device, you don't need the cert. You actually don't want to have the third party certificate authority in the middle. Having a key exchange is actually sufficient. Um, and we're going to have effectively native support for the service assisted communication model I just talked about. Um, you will generally authenticate at the channel level. So whatever that channel is, MQP, HTTP, et cetera. Um, and then authenticate, uh, authenticate and then be authorized against the gateway based on that device registry. Um, there's also going to be a blacklist um, for tokens. And then all the messages that are coming in there are tagged by us with the identity of that device. So that is something that the device can't spoof. The device can't say, I'm sending, I'm the device so-and-so, which you can currently do, right? Today you can say, I'm device so-and-so, but you don't have to go and prove that you're device so-and-so. So we're actually stamping that on based on the authentication result. And then also what we're going to add is um, device management, a device management foundation, so that you can do software updates through that system, that you can go and get the state of your devices through that system. And software updates is something that is obviously super, super important um, if you want to follow a secure processes. So last three minutes, let me speculate about the future a little bit. There's a lot of IoT challenges. I already talked about some of them. right? There is cost pressure on device hardware, cheap sensors, weak or no crypto, the source of randomness. If you, need to, if you want to do crypto, you have to start with some random numbers. And creating random numbers on a super, super tiny chip is kind of hard. Time management is hard. Right? Just the fact of, of not having a real-time clock in a super cheap device, try to do that on, on Arduino. Good luck. Um, there's an analog gap. You know, with analog audio, DRM has kind of failed. And the reason why DRM has failed is because it's kind of, hard, it's kind of easy to go and play it back and record it back with very minimal um, fidelity loss. The analog gap also exists on the other side. Because um, you can go and degrade the, a sensor. You can cheat on a sensor, right? You have a temperature sensor, and you hold a lighter in front of it. There's all kinds of You can do physical hacks against digital systems where the digital systems can't, can't cope with them, especially not if they're cheap. Industrial-grade sensors can deal with them because they have defenses against that, and they can go and spot those things. But cheap sensors can't. So what that means is that the defense in depth is often broken kind of at the lowest levels at the device and the field gateway layer, also because there's legacy. There's a lot of stuff that we'll have to deal with which just can't, which we won't be able to secure because it's 30 years old. So we already have assisted services to communication. We have, we have uh, machine identity and access authorization that we can do architecturally and that we're covering. Further out, stuff where we're also going to tackle is, for instance, data stream authorization. We're going to take a look at the data streams and actually we'll figure out who's pro we have to go and figure out who's authorized to get that data and process that data in collaborative environments like a factory. We'll have to go and figure out what is the plausibility of that data. Is the sensor bad? And integrate data quality concerns with these with these authorization concerns. A hacked sensor and a broken sensor are indistinguishable. So data quality is something that is part of the platform that we think we can provide to help with that. Also, for privacy, if you take the a rental car scenario, you have a rental car, you rent the car, you sit in it, you drive. Two weeks later, you call the rental car company and say, hey, delete my data. Well. The rental car company has legitimate rights to collect the information from the vehicle. So there's got to be a way to attach your identity from, to that system and then remove your identity from that in a secure way. 
So that's all stuff that we're dealing with. How do we deal with privacy? How do we deal with data quality? How do we deal with trust in those environments? And to really also have this, the, the safety notion kind of flow into those systems. So IoT security is a shared responsibility, security concepts um, to the edge. You should in implement the security development lifecycle. You can get help from us. The cybersecurity experts at Microsoft uh, can actually help with that. Um, leverage industry best practices. And then there's a lot of stuff that we do already. Um, you can start with the Azure IoT suite and the services we have already. Event Hub is a great start. The reference architecture is a great start. And then I would also ask you to review our platform principles and certifications because they're really part of that process. We have a lot of them already we're making huge investments and we're extending those even further. And with that, thank you very much for spending that time with us. And I hope that was somewhat enlightening. Have a good conference.